between private and public interests. To discuss this issue, we've gathered quite a panel today, so let me first briefly introduce you uh, to our speakers today for more detailed um, titles on the screen. Professor Franco Cavalli, renowned ecologist, former member of the Swiss Parliament. Mr. Cavalli will talk about the problem of access to medicines, essential treatments, from his long professional experience. Dr. Ellen Toon, public health advocate, renowned expert and a lawyer from the Netherlands. She will explain how the pharma business model is, works uh, with regard to patents and introduce the main instrument at hand for government to protect public health. Dr. Francisco Rossi, director of ePharma, his organization initiated the petition in Colombia for a declaration of public interest uh, on Novartis cancer treatment. He will therefore provide a first-hand testimony of the pressures that the government faces when trying to go down this route and discuss the problematic role played by, played by the authorities in that saga. My colleague Patrick Durich, he will present the landmark uh, campaign that Publica is launching today for affordable drugs. And last but not least, former president of the Swiss Confederation, Ruth Dreyfus, who has honored her today with her presence. She also co-chaired the UN high-level panel on access to medicines. Conference should last about 45 minutes. We will then have time for your questions and remarks on this very important topic that concerns each and every one of us, not only as professionals, but also uh, as, as citizens and as potential patients. Thank you for your attention. Enjoy the conference. Mr. Kefal. Well, <clears throat> good afternoon to everybody. I will uh, briefly discuss, as the first speaker, the role of uh, drugs in cancer treatment without slides, but uh, trying to be as simple uh, as possible. Well, using drugs in the cancer treatment is what we call uh, systemic treatment, which is the, in contrast to the so-called local treatments, which are surgery and uh, radiotherapy. And uh, systemic treatment is becoming more and more important in the treatment of cancer, although it's the youngest one since it has started roughly after uh, World War II. But before doing that, I just want to remind you, we should not forget that prevention and early diagnosis are even more important. If in the last 10 years, the overall mortality because of cancer in the rich countries has slightly decreased, it's more because of prevention and early diagnosis than bef because of treatment. Now, cancer is already now the health problem number one in the rich countries, and it will soon become also the health problem number one in the developing countries. And this is not widely uh, appreciated. There is a very rapid transformation in the developing country from infectious diseases to non-transmissible diseases, mainly to, uh, to uh, cancer. If in 1970, only 70% of the global burden of cancer was in the developing world, it has been calculated that by 2030, 70% of the death because of cancer, and that means somewhere between 14 and 15 million deaths, uh, will be uh, in the low and middle income countries. Now, the main problem there uh, uh, are that Nothing is really prepared for that. There is a lack of prevention, a lack of early uh, diagnosis of pathologists, of surgeons, of radiotherapy. There are more than 30 countries in the world which do not have one single radiotherapeutic uh, equipment. But if we come to drugs, the problem is not so much that of human resources, but it's more the problem of cost. 95% of the consumption of anti-cancer drugs is in the rich countries, and the rest of the world consumes about 5%. Uh, the problem is cost. Uh, just to simplify it, 25 years ago, here in Switzerland, uh, a monthly treatment 
systemic treatment for cancer costed somewhere between 500 and 750 francs. Today, it is about 20, 22,000. That means that it has increased by 40, 50 uh, times. The drugs which come now to the market cost at least $100,000 per patient per year, and sometimes 120, 130, 150. So, uh, and you have to calculate that very often oncologists do not use one drug alone, but combine drugs. So by combining drugs, you are at a cost, at a yearly cost of 250, $300,000 per patient. Another consequences of this situation is not only that this is no longer uh, payable for our uh, countries, is that um, there is a shortage of old drugs, which are still very good, but very cheap, so that there is a, an artificial decrease in the production of the old drugs in order to oblige us to use the new ones, which are much more expensive. Or if the old drug is still available, uh, generally it is produced just by one company, which has increased the cost of the old drug <laughs> with no expenses at all, sometimes by 500, 1,000 percent. We remember the guy in New York, which is now in jail, who increased that by 5,000 five, 5, uh, percent. So these are all consequences of this uh, situation, which is no longer uh, sustainable even for uh, rich uh, countries. Uh, what do we have now in Switzerland? The situation is that um, when a new drug arrives, it is accepted by the Swiss medic, and then it's the second step. It must go to the federal office um, of social expenses, which will then decide whether the drug will be paid by the base, basic insurance. People who have a complementary insurance, and these are 20, 22 percent of the population, so the 20, 22 percent uh, richer in Switzerland, they c might get the drug immediately. And now, because of the cost, the federal office is delaying as much as possible uh, the moment when uh, the normal patient will get the drug because of the basic insurance. It might take two, it might take three years, and it will introduce always more limitations. That means this drug can be used only as a second or a third line treatment, like it has been the case for the hepatitis, hepatitis drug. That means we can use that only in situations which are no longer favorable for the patient. So a delay and a limitation excluding the most favorable situation which would be uh, for us if we could use that from the very beginning. Um, I am a member of the uh, WHO committee which has to put together the list of the es essential medicines. And in the last years, we have included in this list three or four drugs which do not cost uh, um, 100,000 per year, but will, which cost 30 to 35, 40,000 francs per year, and which are very important because they can increase the cure rate of the patient. So these are not palliative drugs, are curative drugs. But the vast majority of the people in the world, including East Europe, Romania, Bulgaria, and, and those countries have no access to that because patients have to pay out of the pocket to get uh, those uh, drugs. So if the, if the situation is very difficult already here, it is absolutely impossible for 100,000 or even million of patients in the less rich uh, countries. Another problem, which is well described in the documentation that you have received, is that this uh, monopolistic situation is not increasing, as it is often said, the innovation. is decreasing innovation because you have a monopoly for 20 years, you don't have to do anything, and then you can just modify a little bit the drug and leading to the so-called Me Too drugs, which means just a little bit improved perhaps, but not really innovative. And that has led to the fact that lately two very big um, studies in the US and in Europe has, have demonstrated that 60% of the drugs 
cancer drugs, which have been accepted to the market in the last 15 years, are of no or of very limited value. Their mean gain in survival is two months, but you have among them three or four which are very good, but the others, and we talk about 50 drugs, have almost no, uh, no advantage in, in comparison to the old ones, but I are, are accepted just because of the potency of the uh, pharma lobby. To conclude, what can we do? We will discuss a lot about um, compulsory uh, licensing, but there are different models. I just, I just briefly summarize one which has been put forward by the Nobel Prize in Economist, Dr. Stiglitz, uh, who has been saying for many years now that the situation is economically unsustainable. And he's saying we have to change the system to abandon or lower the importance of, of patents, that we have to find another way to compensate the industries which really produce innovation, and that we have to have, again, the states involved in the development uh, of new drugs, which they have uh, abandoned 25 years ago, and today everything is in the hands of the pharmaceutical company, the clinical studies. Clinical studies should be, again, financed mainly by the public uh, hand, so to supervise the, uh, uh, the outcome and to avoid what we have today, that the clinical trials are carried out in an extremely selected population, which do not represent the bulk of the patients that we are confronted with daily, so that based on this very selected population and on preliminary data, you get to the market, and later on, post-marketing studies, as I have been saying, uh, will then demonstrate that these drugs are much less efficacious than it was claimed <coughs> at the beginning. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Eleanor Thun. I would like to start by thanking Public Eye to, you believe it, right? Okay. Um, for, uh, for inviting me to speak at this, uh, this very moment, uh, this very important moment. Uh, in, in time, it is also an honor for me to be in the presence of Madame Dreyfus, who has done so much very, very important work to advance this, this agenda. Now, I'm going to give to you the briefest introduction you've ever had to patents and compulsory licensing. I've been told I have eight minutes. I studied this for years, and I think I finally begin to get it. So bear with me. Um, I, um, right, I'll, I'll, I'll dive right into it. Uh, let's start with the function of, of patents, which is, as Professor Cavalli already explained, sort of the cornerstone of our innovation system by encouraging inventors to make investments in time and money to develop new products that we uh, hopefully, that we hopefully need uh, by ex providing them with exclusive rights to their innovation. That means that they can exclude others from using their invention. It is a common misunderstanding that a patent is a property right. It is not a property, like you can own your house or your bicycle or, or a bottle of water. It is, a, it is a negative right. You have the right to exclude others. In the field of, um, of pharmaceuticals, I should add, there are several other exclus exclusivities. It's not just patents. There's actually a whole array of exclusive rights out there, and some are even more uh, sort of forceful than patents, but um, let's, let's stick to this. It is therefore a social policy tool. It is meant to create benefits to society as a whole, not just to the holders of these patents. That is the framework, but it comes at a cost for society. Now, if that cost to society is not acceptable, not bearable, then the state, the government, can intervene, actually needs to intervene. Um, and I'll come back to that, uh, come back to that later. They have tools to do that. 
um, Professor Cavalli already mentioned compulsory licensing. There are variants of that. For example, government use of patents, which is the government basically giving a compulsory license to itself. And why do we have this exclusive, these exclusive periods? It's particularly important for pharmaceuticals because many of the pharmaceuticals that we're talking about, including some of those uh, cancer medicines that have been put on the WHO essential medicines list, are very, very cheap to make. So if you do not give the manufacturer or the inventor, I should say, which is often not the same, different subject, um, not the opportunity to exploit the invention by giving an exclusive right, uh, generic competition will very quickly drive the price down, and the concern of that is that the, um, uh, the, 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 the stimulus to continue to invest in the development of these products will disappear. That is the thinking uh, behind this. But if the cost to society is too high, what can happen? Well, governments can intervene. Governments can issue a compulsory license, which means give another the right to use that invention. That could, for example, be generic companies. You could also, that right could also lead to the importation of lower cost uh, generic medicines from elsewhere. What a compulsory license or a government use license does is it lifts the monopoly effect of a patent. The patent stays in place. The patent holder, if that's the company, keeps the patent and the patent holder is entitled to a reasonable remuneration when someone else makes use of that patent. It is part of patent law. You can actually not have a sensible patent law if you do not also have robust provisions for compulsory licensing and government use. It is part of the balancing act of the social contract. But of course, that balancing act only works if governments indeed make use of these provisions when needed. I mean, that has to be, that has to be said. You can find it in almost all patent law. You can certainly find it um, in the TRIPS agreement, uh, Article 31. There is a special uh, compulsory license for, for export, 31 bis. That is the only ever amendment to a piece of WTO legislation for public health reasons. Um, and of course, the Doha Declaration on TRIPS and Public Health, which, uh, which clarifies these options, uh, these options further. And I would like to argue that the human right to health actually puts a duty on states to make use of this provision if not making use of this provision means that people do not have access to proven effective life-saving medicines. That's the statement I would like to uh, make here. Now, we have a lot of lessons to learn from what happened with HIV AIDS. You often hear people say compulsory licensing, we talk about it's never been used. That's actually not true particularly after the adoption of the Doha Declaration on TRIPS and Public Health, the use of the TRIPS flexibilities, of which compulsory licensing is only one, increased dramatically. Countries made a very large scale use of these provisions, particularly the government use, to enable the importation and the supply of generic antiretroviral medicines. In this period, this is sort of the, this is shortly after the Global Fund was, uh, was established and people were seeking ways to use that money wisely and buy wisely. That meant pre-qualified, the WHO pre-qualified uh, antiretrovirals. These mechanisms were used very widely. Um, the, you then see uh, a period after that licensing, voluntary licensing, became more of the norm because that is often the response by patent holders. They say, well, they don't like the compulsory, but you can persuade them to then uh, license in another manner. You see another pickup here of increased number of compulsory licenses. These are almost all compulsory licenses, most of them for non-communicable diseases and most of those for cancer medication. Now, how that trend will further develop, uh, we will continue to study, but uh, there are important lessons to be, to be learned, and I think the full article on this uh, slide is available to you. So the, these are the countries that have used TRIPS flexibility in the procurement of, uh, of generic uh, medicines. Um, but what is interesting today is that the discussion about the use of compulsory licensing is really gaining steam in, uh, in Europe. Here are just some examples of what is happening today. In France, cancer researchers 
have requested publicly that the government uses government use powers for cancer drug. In Germany, a court ordered, a, in, in, this was in a patent dispute, a compulsory license for an HIV medicine, referring to the public health needs to do so. Greece, high cost of, of medication uh, has, has led to calls of, and, and, and the withdrawal of cancer medicines by companies has led to calls for the use of compulsory licensing. In Ireland, the Irish Medical Association has adopted a resolution calling on the government to issue a government use license for hepatitis C medication. In Italy, the competition authorities are very active and use compulsory licensing to combat um, anti-competitive behavior. Romania is contemplating, has contemplated the use of compulsory licensing for hepatitis C medication. Scotland uh, recently requests by cancer patients who do not have access to particular breast cancer drug have, have petitioned the government to issue a crown use. In, in, in the UK, a government use is called crown use because they have the crown. Uh, Spain, same thing. In the Netherlands, uh, our Minister of Health has, uh, has publicly declared to uh, seriously investigate the use of uh, compulsory licensing to deal with high drug prices. And again, often this is done in reference to uh, the high cost of cancer medication. And in the UK, cancer patients have requested, uh, have requested the same. Um, all to say, um, this issue has now become a global issue. We can learn a lot from what we have done with HIV and what countries have done to, to increase access to antiretroviral um, um, medicines, but um, we're, we're dealing with a global, with a global crisis. Um, I want to just, just run quickly through a few common misunderstandings, if, if, I, if I may, Madam Chair. Uh, how many seconds do I have for that? This was a 12-week course, okay, in my law school. All right, uh, the, uh, the compulsory licensing never been used. I think I've dealt with that. If you don't believe me, the paper is in the back. The other one is, it's only for emergencies and cancer is not an emergency. First of all, <laughs> one may argue that cancer is becoming an emergency, but let's, let's set that aside. Uh, this is simply not true. If you use compulsory licensing in an emergency situation, it's a little quicker because you don't have to first try to get a voluntary license. So it's a little faster. That's the only difference. You do not need an emergency to intervene. It's only for infectious diseases. Not true. You can, you can, give it f you can use it for whatever reason you want, whatever disease or product you, you, you want. Um, it's only for use by low-income countries. That is also not true. I already explained. You find it in all, uh, in all patent law. Uh, one that we hear recently more and more, and I wonder where it's coming from, is compulsory licensing is theft. Well, it, it's not. I think I explained that in the, in the, in the, in the introduction why that is not. Uh, compulsory licensing will halt innovation. Now, that's not a 12-week course, but certainly a one-hour one additional conference to address that one. There's no evidence uh, that it does. I do think that we need to have a conversation about whether our current innovation system, based on exclusivity as the primary way of incentivizing it, is the best possible system, whether it is the most efficient way of doing that. And that is a conversation I was listening this morning to the World Health Assembly that a number of, uh, of member states are putting on the table here. And that is really the most important discussion uh, to have. Now, another misunderstanding is compulsory license will solve all your problems. It does not. Uh, it has a very precise uh, role. And that role is limited to situations where the problem is indeed caused by a patent. A patent in itself is not problematic if the price is reasonable and the community and the patients can afford it. And a, and a compulsory license is also not necessary when the company or the patent holder is willing to license the innovation. So uh, we have to put these things in that perspective. I want to leave you with this uh, with this thought by um, the late Sir John Sulston, uh, a great scientist and a great thinker, uh, who once said at a, at a conference, uh, 
uh, that was organized by, by Médecins Sans Frontières, the Access to Essential Medicines campaign, where at the time um, I was working and where I, I learned a lot, a lot about these issues. Uh, he said, intellectual property in the form of patents should be thought of as a very useful tool with a relatively narrow applicability, rather than as a means for owning ever larger swaths of human knowledge, which is the way it is being driven at the moment. I thank you for your uh, attention and on our website you can find a lot more background information than I could share with you today, but I hope I succeeded in giving you a crash course in compulsory licensing. I thank you. Thank you for the organizers, and good afternoon, all of you. Mm. <clears throat> uh, I will take my opportunity and this special opportunity to share with you the situation we faced in Colombia when asked for a compulsory license for Glivec, an Novartis cancer drug you uh, maybe have heard. Mm. And uh, uh, I need to explain <clears throat> very briefly that uh, why we asked for this uh, compulsory license. The patent of uh, Glibeck, Imatinib in Colombia, it was the first one in a very interesting series, series of uh, uh, irregular patents. The, um, Novartis asked for a patent in 1998, and uh, the request was uh, rejected by the, patent, by the patent office because it was the secondary patent without a primary patent in Colombia. It, uh, it is uh, a very technical, very interesting discussion, but uh, it's important that you take into account it was not a uh, usual, uh, normal patent. And uh, after this rejection by the patent office, um, what happened was that uh, Novartis went to the court and obtained it 12 years after a patent ordered by judiciary, which was the first one in Colombia, <clears throat> and opened the door for a lot of requests because it was the Black Friday for the pharmaceutical industry to obtain the patents for rejected patents by the patent office. And we are right now with a lot of these kind of uh, requests to the judiciary because of this precedent of uh, Novartis. Bad news for us. <clears throat> mm, uh, in, in the market, when, when this patent arrived, 12 years after the, the first request, mm, there were more than eight generic versions of imatinib successfully used in the, in the market of Colombia in, in medicine. And uh, because of the patent, all of them were removed and Novartis obtained the whole market and it was a very complex impact in the finances of the health system and uh, in, in health, in the, in the management of patients. So, <clears throat> Uh, we decided as a, a group of NGOs to ask for a compulsory license. <clears throat> uh, the, the organization were uh, IFARMA, which is Health Action International in Colombia, as you can see in Spanish <coughs> in the corner, the Center of Information on Medicines de, of the National University, CIMUN in Spanish, Centro de Información de Medicamentos de la Universidad Nacional, and Mission on Health, Mission Salud. <clears throat> Three organizations that went to ask it for, for this uh, compulsory license. And, <clears throat> okay, I'm, I'm here as a plan B because the intention of the organizers was, was to have here the Minister of Health of Colombia, which uh, I, I must mention that uh, it was very brave uh, confronting the pressure that uh, this request, which uh, they just uh, began to analyze, <clears throat> um, 
move it from the United States, from the Swiss government, from the laboratories, from the pharma, everywhere. And um, he's not here because it was not possible at this moment. Next week we have uh, elections and all politicians are at home <coughs> for obvious reasons. But, uh, okay, I just have uh, 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes, <coughs> But if, if uh, he, he was here, uh, for sure, not have a not enough time to share with you the kind of pressures and the kind of uh, situations he must uh, face. It. Just to mention the, the, the most um, aggressive ones, it was from the government of the United States, which offered some support for the peace process and said, okay, we are going to support you only in the case that the imatinib uh, patent is not breaking, be, break it by a compulsory license. So forget this, uh, this discussion. And uh, in the same way, in the, in, and, and in the same situation by the Swiss government, and uh, of course, most of you, all of you, are aware about the letter that the CEO from Novartis write to, to the President of the Republic, say that uh, your Minister of Health is uh, amazing, is, uh, is, is wrong, and is moving against the innovation and every, every argument you have heard in the past. Mm. I was thinking for a long time that uh, this is a kind of problem, uh, this is a kind of north-south confronting, is some kind of empire and colony discussion. Because if you think about <coughs> uh, the, the tool to extract richness from the colony to the empire is monopolies. It's an historical fact, an economical fact, and uh, think about patents are monopolies. It's interesting. We, in, in, in some discussions about patents for medicines, mentioned that there are some, some uh, connections between slavery and patents for medicines. Interesting. <clears throat> but um, at this moment, I'm I am almost sure that it's not a problem about North-South. It's about the, the problem of uh, the people with privileges. Because pe privileged people uh, are very brave and are very subtle and are very... <clears throat> you can choose a lot of adjectives. Mm, but at the end, which you can see in every one of these discussions is that uh, privileged people obtain the support of governments to act defending their privileges and moving against the citizen. I was wondering why the Swiss government, and it's a question for you, it's a question for you, <laughs> um, why the, the Swiss government, instead to discuss with the with the pharmaceutical industry, the price of drugs, prefer to move to uh, restrict, to, to, to put, uh, put uh, conditions on access to medicines for patients, for citizens. So it's, uh, it's uh, a decision in favor of privileges and against the citizens. And there are a lot of... Uh, a lot of cases, I, I just remember the case of a civil servant in the United States. His, her son died because uh, it's not possible to afford uh, diabetes drugs in the United States right now. So governments are working more in, in this side. Just to finish, um, we, we moved a lot against these pressures. Uh, remember that uh, any compulsory license in developing countries was for free, was 
was the result of a lot of brave of the government and uh, a lot of efforts from civil society organizations. <clears throat> and uh, we asked WHO, WIPO, and, uh, and the WTO, because these kind of pressures are out of the, of the rules. And uh, we said to them, in, in, in a letter you can find in a lot of places, we have that in, in our web page, I can send any one of you interested. And we said to these organizations, okay, you are the defenders of the global system on health and on intellectual property. And if you don't do something to equilibrate the system, to defend the system, the system is going to crash. And uh, we are waiting, we sent this letter in February, and we are waiting for an answer until now. Mm. I just uh, want to finish mentioning that uh, I'm not sure we can rely on governments. I'm sure uh, civil society organizations play a major role in, in this discussion, and we are working on that and we are we will uh, do that uh, for the future and uh, I think uh, the other power that can balance that, that can make a, a contribution to, to this balance is the media and I'm very happy because I'm here by an invitation of a civil society organization in a press uh, conference room, so I think I am in the correct place at the current time. Thank you very much. <coughs> okay. Thank you all. Um, it's my pleasure to present the uh, campaign that we are launching today. We're disclosing for the first time in public the visual of the campaign. Uh, I don't know if you can read it, but it just says, I need 100,000 francs, Swiss francs, for uh, uh, a cancer treatment, and in brackets at the bottom, or your signature, and you will understand why uh, as we go uh, forward. This campaign is being supported by the Swiss Cancer League uh, and I'd like, uh, because they, uh, they, are, they are giving also this, this additional dimension to the campaign, I'd like to, to give the floor, he couldn't be here unfortunately, to the, to the chair of the Swiss Cancer League. Uh, his name is Gilbert Zulian and it's about a, a five minutes, four, four and a half minutes video where he explains, and now that we have traveled in Colombia, in Europe, in a lot of places, now we are coming back to the Swiss issue, like uh, Professor Cavalli started with. On a besoin de faire en sorte que partout en Suisse, que ce soit dans les vallées, que ce soit dans les cités, que ce soit dans la plaine, lorsqu'une substance qu'on appellera médicament est jugée utile, elle soit accessible à tous. À l'intérieur même d'un traitement pour un patient, on a pu observer que tout à coup ce traitement lui était dénié. On vous paye deux cycles de chimiothérapie, mais pas les autres. C'est impossible de faire comprendre aux citoyens pourquoi. C'est juste euh, inacceptable en réalité, comme, euh, comme, comme cas d'espèce. Alors bon, il n'y en a pas des milliers, on est d'accord, mais je dirais qu'un seul suffit à éveiller notre attention sur le fait que c'est une situation qui peut se reproduire et déboucher véritablement sur un système qui, à ce moment-là, sera au minimum à deux vitesses, si ce n'est pas plus spécifiquement pour des questions de coût, je n'ai pas d'expérience personnelle 
qu'un patient n'a pas reçu le médicament à la fin. En revanche, il a dû, ce patient, faire appel à des aides extérieures pour avoir accès à ce médicament. Sans qu'on lui ait dit « on ne vous le donne pas parce qu'il est trop cher ». Personne n'écrit ça. En revanche, nous, médecins, soignants, on peut avoir l'impression que le médicament n'a pas été pris en charge par l'assurance à cause de son prix. Le coût d'un médicament incite l'un ou l'autre médecin à ne pas le prescrire de peur qu'il ne soit pas pris en charge. J'ai envie de dire que jusqu'à présent, il a bien fonctionné. Très franchement, on a en Suisse un des meilleurs systèmes, si ce n'est le meilleur système sanitaire au monde, avec une juste répartition des coûts entre les différents acteurs. Et un système qui est supportable au plan de ce que le citoyen paye à travers ses cotisations obligatoire pour l'assurance maladie et puis ses cotisations obligatoires pour l'impôt. Euh, maintenant, je reconnais que l'arrivée sur le marché de substances qui ne sont plus en milliers ni même en dizaines de milliers de francs, mais en centaines de milliers de francs, met à mal cet équilibre. Et aujourd'hui, à mon avis, le peuple a commencé à crier parce que les primes sont devenues insupportables. Moi, je cite régulièrement l'exemple malvenu, je le consens, des États-Unis, où la moitié des personnes qui souffrent de maladies cancéreuses et qui reçoivent des traitements anticancéreux finissent ruinées, meurent, ruinées. Ce n'est pas notre style de, de vie, notre philosophie sociétale, elle n'est elle pas celle-là. Et, et, et il faut, faut qu'on arrive à quelque chose. Autrement, on va dans le mur. Et plusieurs l'ont déjà dit. Donc on, on, va, on va devoir s'adapter de plus en plus à un vieillissement de population qui fait augmenter le nombre de maladies cancéreuses pour lesquelles on doit apporter une réponse soignante avec des médicaments quand ceux-ci sont à disposition. La Ligue suisse, elle a un réseau qui permet de montrer les besoins réels de la population auxquels les autorités se doivent de faire en sorte de pouvoir répondre. Le rôle de l'État, c'est de protéger les citoyens. Peut-être pas contre les tremblements de terre, ça n'y arrive pas. Mais contre les effets néfastes que les maladies entraînent sur la société elle-même, en termes de perte d'années, ou même de perte de rôle et de fonction. C'est pour ça que le système suisse, il faut le préserver. Il faut réussir à garder cet esprit de, de partage qui est, le nôtre, qui est le nôtre. On est vraiment une, 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 une communauté d'intérêts qui a envie de poursuivre l'aventure en partageant ses richesses. Fondamental, ça. Le geek de service. Um, okay. okay, thanks. Um, I think it, it gave you uh, an idea of, uh, of the situation seen from a perspective of an expert organization like the, like the Swiss Cancer League. There's one of eight videos that we are launching today uh, of expert videos. Two of them uh, are among us. Professor Franco Cavalli is also. Uh, We also have a video on Madame Ruth Dreyfus also on these issues. So why this campaign in Switzerland? Uh, we are struggling with the price control mechanism, this has been said, and patent monopolies gives an extraordinary pricing power to the, uh, to the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, cancer drugs, this has been said often, 100,000 or even more a year. Novartis has launched in the US uh, cancer, cancer treatment, treatment rather than a drug, drug at half a million dollars for one, one use, one injection. 
So basically, uh, the uh, escalating crisis uh, is, is, is really leaving or put, put a serious burden on the financial sustainability of health systems. Uh, rationing already happened, this was mentioned with hepatitis C, and will only increase with, this, uh, with these uh, price hikes. Uh, there are legal solutions. We've discussed it. I won't, dis uh, I won't talk about the instrument again. It's compulsory licensing. Just to say, the campaign is not to abolish the patent system. The, the, the campaign is to restore a broken balance. And that's the original idea of patents. Basically, public interest versus private interest. Um, I just give you here an example that we have studied in particular which is related to breast cancer drug Pregetta. And this is, I think, a good example of pricing power. In Switzerland, for a drug to be reversed, it has to be on the list. This is the list of specialties. It has been admitted in 2013, but then was withdrawn uh, in 2014 due to disagreement over price. Uh, basically, patients were taken hostage. Uh, because, because of this disagreement between, between Roche and, and the uh, Federal Office of Public Health. It was readmitted in 2015, but at an even higher price. Whereas, in, uh, in the past, it was considered an economical at, at the precedent price. So, this is unbelievable, and this just shows the enormous pressure that uh, lies on, on the uh, Federal Office of Public Health and the pricing power. An annual cost of Pregetta is about 60,000 francs. If you combine it, as Professor Kalali said, these are combined treatment, it's over 100 per patient. Roche has three out of four treatments for this specific category of breast cancer, which are her two positive for those who know it. But Herceptin is, is not, not a recent drug. They have been marketed since 1999, and they had over 70 billion revenue since launch. Since launch. So when is it enough? And basically, the main question is, is the price level of Pregetta really justified? The main objective of the campaign is to raise public awareness on the link between these patent monopolies and drug prices, to show also that universal health coverage is at stake, even in pharma land, if nothing is done. We, we want, want to have, have a public, public debate, debate on a useful but largely unknown or even discredited legal tool to safeguard public health. health. These are compulsory licensing. And, and by considering, considering such a tool, a government new license, Switzerland would really send a strong signal, not only for domestic purposes, but also internationally. Switzerland is hosting a major health organization here mainly in Geneva. So Switzerland has a special role and a special duty also uh, in terms of, of sending signals uh, towards the outside. Our demands will be that the Swiss government handle seriously against excessive drug prices, not through the existing drug price control mechanism, because this one is useless. We need something else. Uh, to to recognize, recognize, but fully recognize, recognize the use of compulsory licensing where public interest dictates. We, we want them to stop pressure, Francisco has just said it, on sovereign countries using compulsory licensing for public health purposes. So there are two instances, Colombia, Thailand, a couple of years ago, where Switzerland became uh, vocal and, and, and threatened of, uh, of commercial uh, issues if those countries would, would move forward. Switzerland should amend the Swiss health foreign policy. This is a document that's been uh, adopted by, by the government, different departments, different uh, uh, ministries. But the part on compulsory licensing is referring to what Ellen just said this sort of misleading information or uh, restrictions. Basically, the Swiss say it's only in emergency situations. And this cannot be accepted anymore. This needs to change. And finally, uh, the Swiss government should stop imposing what we call TRIPS plus provisions, basically asking for even more protection, even further patent protection, patent term extensions, that exclusive or whatever, 
uh, in their bilateral free trade agreements. And they are currently negotiating with India, which has an important role also as, uh, as pharmacy of the, of the poor, or even within Indonesia. These are our campaigning instruments. We will be releasing an expert report today. Maybe you've seen it in your, in your, uh, in your material. We will launch a petition, which is called Appel Collectif French Sammelbeschwerde in German. We'll have a dedicated campaign website and tools. We'll have these eight videos I referred to. And we will have street actions. One is currently taking place as we speak in Zurich with the key visual that I showed you before and that you see again here. Hmm? I'll, I'll check again if it works. <laughs> it doesn't, otherwise I'll do it, I'll do it afterwards. Uh, on the right hand side you can see the eight videos. This will all be available online with all the all the material. Uh, now I have a problem. <laughs> but I think I, I was... Oh. Anyway, I was, uh, I was at the end of my presentation. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. You can find also footage from our action, street action in Zurich, probably already online uh, on the German page. And you have all the links in the press kit. So before opening the round of questions, I'd like to give the floor to former president of the Swiss Confederation, Madame <coughs> Dreyfus, who also uh, co-chaired the UN high-level panel on access to medicines. Uh, as such, you contributed to a very important landmark report uh, which was published in 2016 on how to promote innovation and uh, access to health technology. So maybe you can tell us um, a bit more on the recommendation related to our topic today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for, and welcome to all of you, and thank you for the invitation here. Um, yes, I... I was very honored to have the opportunity to co-chair this report uh, mandated by the Secretary General of the UN, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. And this is mainly on uh, finding new balances between public health uh, needs and the need for innovation and, and to, um, to try to find also solution for what is neglected by the system of incentives we have now. Because we can discuss a long time about the necessity to keep or not to keep the patent system. It is working for a lot of, uh, of disease. It, had, it has worked very well also for, for years, but it has also its failure, and the failures are clearly that uh, uh, they are not uh, producing innovation for neglected disease, I call them also uh, neglected patients, uh, in the double sense that some diseases do not bring enough patient to make a return of investment very effective. Rare disease uh, is, is, a, is a, a common world now. On the other side, that if the patients are too poor to pay for the medicine, there is no incentive to produce what they need. So uh, this is really what uh, is clear now for, I, I would say, 20 years, something like this. Uh, it was also discussed uh, in the frame of uh, VTO uh, in relation with the international duties of the members of VTO to respect uh, intellectual property rights, but immediately it was decided that a balance should be found between uh, public health needs and uh, the obligation to respect intellectual property rights. So the WHO mandated also another uh, report. It was published in 2006 and was is it's perhaps a more analytical 
uh, report, but with the same recommendation. And I must say, these recommendations are always timely, but they are not realized for a large uh, proportion. So the last, uh, the last report, so uh, what I said before is really, we are not, this report is not a report against uh, intellectual property, but it wants to put something very clear. For instance, in our mandate, it was asked to find a balance or to overcome incoherencies, this was the word chosen by the Secretary General, between uh, the right of the inventor. Intellectual property is not the right of the inventor. Intellectual property is a contract, a social contract between an enterprise and uh, the state, giving this, uh, Ellen explained it very, very well, giving these rights of exclusivity under conditions. One of the conditions is the disclosure of uh, uh, the process that linked to the, uh, bring to the, to the result so that uh, Generica can enter as soon as the exclusivity has finished, can enter into the market because there is a publicly available res recipe, recipe about how to produce something. Now one of the problem that we always face is that there is a possibility to add something to, uh, to uh, invention, let's say now a medicine, so that you can prolong and prorogate the protection. And Glivec is a very good example of that. If I may, uh, Dr. Rossi, just make a, a little comparison. It was just in the time we were working that uh, Colombia tried to have a compulsory license. They had to renounce. They had to use it as a negotiation tool. They were successful in reducing the price, but they were not successful in uh, declaring a, a compulsory license due to the pressure uh, Dr. Uh, Rossi explained. Uh, and I think also because it's difficult to have a government being really coherent in this position. Generally, you have a health minister who wants a compulsory license and a trade minister who will be more reluctant. And this is a, a case we find in many, many uh, countries. Uh, the same problem with Glivec was in India. And uh, in that case, Switzerland was quite reluctant to threaten India because it's a big partner, and they didn't want to have a trade war with India. But having or threatening a trade war with Colombia, which is a little market, a poor country, and so on, was something that Switzerland could afford, to my shame. So if I speak about Glivec, it is because it's absolutely a case where the discussion is, is it a new medicine or not? And the Indian government and the Indian Supreme Court said it's not a new medicine, it's just the old medicine where something was added, adjuvant, salts. But the molecule, the active molecule, is the same that was protected with an earlier patent that was no longer valid. So this is just to explain how difficult the situation is if you try really to limit the exclusivity exactly to what is the new invention. Now, this was just a, a commentary also to, to, to this case, which is a very interesting uh, case, also from the political point of view, but also from the innovation point of view of the pharmaceutical industry. Now, to be short, what are the conclusions of the high-level panel? I mean, the most important conclusion is what you heard uh, from Ellen and others. It is the right of the states to decide what is the case in which a compulsory license can be decided. There is no international rule that can really uh, 
make the government not able to say we are in a situation where we need this compulsory license. So it's not emergency only. It's not a situation where others can decide if it is legitimate to make a compulsory license. It is a sovereign right. And this is the reason why the campaign also for Switzerland is so, uh, is so important. So our call is a call to make the respect of this agreement, the Doha agreement, and what is uh, given as a balance between trade laws and uh, intellectual property uh, laws included in the trade laws and uh, public health has to be uh, used. These tools are in the hand of the government. And we are also uh, in this uh, report very uh, bold, I would say, saying that the free trade agreements that are going beyond, beyond the rules of uh, TRIPS and the Doha Declaration are, shouldn't be decided. Because these uh, TRIPS Plus allow to have longer time of protection they allow, for instance, in some cases, not to disclose the studies that were made to, in order, the clinical studies to, uh, are which are presented to receive an agreement and a price setting in the country. So respect the TRIPS uh, and don't go to TRIPS plus. Secondly, public uh, financing of innovation is often neglected in the setting of the prices. You have public <coughs> investment at the beginning in the fundamental research. You have also uh, often, uh, for instance, for rare disease uh, subsidies that are given by the states. And these are generally not taken into consideration by the price setting, which means as uh, one of the members of the commission said, that often state uh, pays twice. The, 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 they pay for the innovation and they pay through the price to uh, give uh, more uh, to the uh, innovative uh, industry. The very important point is transparency. And for me, as a former minister of health of this country, it is perhaps the most important. Uh, the, the emphasis we put on transparency is, I think, something new in the discussion. Because we, many things I, we heard today are, as I told uh, now, uh, 12 or 20 years old. But we have to call for transparency of the innovation process and the price setting by the industry. And I can just tell you, as a Minister of Health, I often had the impression that I was fighting with a hand behind my, attached behind my, my back, because in front of me, I had people who had information about the cost of innovation, the cost of production, and so, and I was just in, in the dark trying to understand what was really the medicine worth. So these are the main, uh, the main recommendation. And I, I would just add a remark we put at the beginning of our report. We are always speaking about medicine. But medicine are just one element in the chain, in the therapeutic chain that is needed. We need vaccine. We need uh, diagnostic. We need medicine. But we need also uh, medical devices. And in all these, you find the same, and perhaps uh, in, a, in a greater uh, amplitude, the same problem of the price setting. I can tell you for medical devices, the benefits are greater. The intransparency of the system of innovation is greater. Uh, for vaccine, for um, diagnostic, we are now exactly in the same situation of having new diagnostic that are very, very uh, expensive. And we have the problem to know how far they can be patented or not. 
because they are working with living uh, elements. So we never should forget that we have to take into consideration the whole chain of biomedical uh, answers to disease. And uh, we brought one example, and I was very touched to meet the person that is uh, quoted here. It is a person in South Africa. She uh, was never tested for tuberculosis until the disease really was uh, obvious and she suffered uh, and her lungs uh, suffered. Uh, she was not vaccinated. She was not tested. She became ill. She was treated only by, uh, by the help of uh, NGO. And she became, um, how do you say Death. Death. Death by, uh, as a consequences of her TB. So she needed also an uh, implant to be able to hear. So you see at this example, and this lady had no support from public, uh, from public entities, had no insurance, and so she was saved only by uh, the charity. Uh, and uh, this shows exactly the chain between vaccine, testing, diagnostic, uh, med uh, treatment, and the medical devices you can uh, need to have a normal life. So uh, it is one conclusion, and the other conclusion it was uh, told before is it's no longer a problem for the poor country. It's a global problem, but the poor country suffers more about the consequences of a failed system. Thank you, all of you, for your presence, your presentation. Now it's time for questions. I propose we take three at a time. Uh, if you have a direct question for one of the experts, you can mention it. And uh, we have about 20 minutes, I would say. Thank you. I don't have a specific question. I just want to say I'm Salumi Mayer from South Africa, Cancer Alliance. And I actually would like to say we would like to participate and with the Swiss because we've launched very much a similar campaign in South Africa. And we hope that with this part participation and joint work, we can actually then promote cancer access and cancer medicines in low middle income countries in Africa. Thank you. Are there remarks or questions? Yes. You have to press the button. Just like that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, at the moment, uh, pardon. Oh, pardon. Elisabeth Eckert, je représente euh, rédaction Tamedia, trois journaux, <laughs> Tribune de Genève, 24 heures le matin dimanche. Um, I would like to know, now is a uh, big uh, assembly from uh, HHO. Tomorrow there will be the um, uh, 50th anniversary of uh, the Association of uh, Pharmaceutical Industry. What do they answer when you say to your campaign, you're not the first to present that? Uh, it's great what you make, but it's, you're not the... Pr what did, did they answer now? Please, everybody. <laughs> I can't say because we just launched it, so I don't know about their reactions. But what I can, what I can guess from previous uh, campaigns and from all the debate about public health and uh, intellectual property, what they will try to say, it's, it's a campaign against patents, it is ruining innovation, we need to, to, to move abroad if it continues like that, and basically uh, 
compulsory licensing is uh, should be used only in exceptional terms, and that goes back what with what Helen said. But it's it, it remains to be seen because uh, I don't know how they would react to that. Well, uh, just a comment because, um, well, this is an information which has not circulated a lot, but it's known in the field that uh, in January, a few counties tried to convince the board of the WHO to discuss that more openly at the General Assembly concerning the two most important points. The first, which is very important, what Ruth said, <clears throat> to oblige a pharmaceutical company to be transparent in, 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 in the cost because they say that they spent billions uh, to bring <clears throat> drugs to the market, which is not true, and all the studies which have been carried out show that it is roughly one-tenth of that. No? But nobody knows exactly, and so it's very important. And the second request was to discuss openly the problem of, of compulsory licensing and so on, and uh, <clears throat> the most important Western country, well, at the end, they were able to more or less block that or to water down that. <laughs> so that's uh, it's very difficult there because, uh, like in all the UN, um, UN uh, organ, I mean, some of the big powers can blockade everything for a long period of time. <coughs> because I had the opportunity in uh, previous time and also through the two uh, commission I, I chaired and co-chaired to listen a lot of the argument of the pharmaceutical uh, industry. I would say the pharmaceutical industry uh, on one side uh, thinks that the system is the best system to uh, promote innovation, okay? But the other argument is uh, that they are doing uh, what they should do uh, to help poor countries with uh, two tools. One is differentiated prices. That means that they and some Swiss industry uh, did a lot in this case. I mean, uh, uh, Roche mainly uh, have a system, a more or less a clear system of prices that are not the same in different countries and different settings. But this is often not uh, a, a real solution because in countries where the patient has to pay out of the pocket, even a low price is not affordable. So taking into account the level of the, uh, I mean, the, the uh, national uh, how do you, uh, how do the Produit National Brut? The GDP, even in countries where uh, Roche is ready to take the GDP as a, as a criteria, uh, you have very poor population that are not able to access to the medicine for, because they are not uh, affordable. Uh, and uh, the, the second uh, argument is uh, that they give uh, some uh, compassionate uh, medicine if it is needed. For instance, in India, the argument they used uh, uh, to say that it was unfair to attack Novartis on the patent on Glivec was that they were given, given, uh, giving uh, Glivec to uh, p some people in India without paying at the, uh, at the end. But I mean, these are not sustainable solutions. Well, I mean, differential prices may be, and it's also one of the proposals we do, but uh, uh, compassionate uh, treatment are not a uh, sustainable solution. So yes, I mean, the pharmaceutical industry is is a strange industry because on one side it's clear that it can be innovative. It is always sure, I mean, it is the industry that has the best conscience, a meilleur conscience. <laughs> because they always say, and I, I just read, for instance, uh, an article where they say uh, the article on Novartis and uh, 
the contract they have with Mr. Cohen uh, industry. Mm -hmm. And if you read the letter of the CEO, it is beautiful. I mean, uh, the problem will be solved, but our medicine will last for for the future of humanity, I mean, and, and, and be uh, the solution for, for everything. So they, they have a very good conscience, and from time to time, I think we should show that uh, they are doing good things, but they are also neglecting many, many patients. Well, I would like to add, just to conclude that, perhaps, um, a personal experience, uh, just with the tools which were now summarized by, by Ruth. I'm personally involved in uh, developing uh, cancer treatment and cancer diagnostic in, in, in Nicaragua, in El Salvador, and in Kyrgyzstan. And we have helped all the three countries to uh, be able to diagnose the CRB2 in women with breast cancer, which is for 20% of them. And there is one drug from Roche Trastuzumab, which is absolutely necessary for them. But no one patient there can get that free of charge. Only patients who can pay out of the pocket, which is a bit less than here, but is still in the order of thousands of francs. So almost nobody can afford that without ruining the family, selling the house, and so on. So no one patient is getting that free of charge in these three counties. I don't know what they are doing in the rest, but I know exactly because I am involved there that this, there is no solution there which has been offered to the patients. Although we have helped the country to develop the diagnostic possibilities to know the 20% of the women who really need that drug. Thank you. I think there's a question up front. Um, <clears throat> my name is Nicola Magrini. I'm the secretary of the Essential Medicine List. Um, I'm great pleasure in hearing all this. And um, I would like just to add a comment. One is on commenting Madame Dreyfus on diagnostics that, as you saw, so New York Times today is quoting the new Essential Diagnostic List from WHO, responding to a request that goes back 20 years. It was actually sought for political reasons 20 years ago. So there are signs of, uh, of changes over time. And um, to expand on the issue on transparency and uh, more symmetrical access to available knowledge, I would like to attract your attention on the fact that um, um, there is growing interest on access to cancer medicine. There is a resolution going on this week at the World Health Assembly. And we have been charged, and Professor Cavalli is charged of the working group that should release a document during the summer or before the summer on magnitude of benefit of cancer medicines. And I think more knowledge on the fact that only a tiny proportion, probably 10% or 20%, I would say 10, of the many cancer medicines approved in the last 15 years, more than 100, probably less than 10, uh, a good candidate for the essential medicine list. I think this should be another platform to share, to think how to, to, to give new solution to an old problem. Um, um, let me just add, for example, that what we did for hepatitis C was the exact contrary. We listed all new hepatitis C medicines to, to, to have more competition there, whereas for cancer medicine, probably we need different uh, approach uh, uh, as it is much more complex. Thank you. I would like to, um, uh, to, to make a comment on, on the role of, of the WHO in this and um, having essential medicines lists or having essential diagnostic tools or essential med medical equipment lists I think is very, very important because it actually signals very clearly that the products that are on those lists, they're essential for a reason. It means that they have to be made available. So price alone cannot be a grounds for, for withholding it. And that speaks to the responsibility of the, of, of the state. Of course, we can ask nicely, uh, would you please lower the price of your products? And in some territories, companies may, may do that, but we're not, with that approach, we're not getting the price that truly meets the, the, the definition of an essential uh, medicine, that it has to be affordable to the, to the community and to the, to the people in, uh, in, in, in question. Um, the, uh, uh, 
the argument in any discussion, whether it is about Switzerland or whether it is about the need to lower prices on the essential medicines list, that if you take that approach, you will negatively affect innovation. Uh, we, we will always hear, and I think we have to start Im immunizing our politicians against that argument because it paralyzes uh, a better informed uh, policy debate. This is also why we need to have, because there, there, is a, there is an atmosphere of anxiety in this field by policymakers. Oh dear, we don't, we don't dare to touch it because the whole world will come crashing down. But we actually lack the essential, the, the essential elements to have a much better informed uh, a policy debate there where we have those elements in the form of greater transparency, data and knowledge about, uh, about what innovation actually costs. Uh, it is incredibly, incredibly revealing. Um, I also find it revealing that the pharmaceutical industry here this week is quite active um, in, in putting out negative messages about this call for greater transparency. I find that actually surprising because uh, it is really the key to, um, uh, to advancing things. Of course, by way of, of, of background, we have to keep in mind that while we're talking about, um, for, for many populations, a failed system, from an industrial point of view, this system is highly successful. The pharmaceutical industry is a, an incredibly profitable uh, industry uh, and, and the companies will defend that and so will their shareholders and that is where a large part of the problem, of the problem lies and without greater transparency, better knowledge about what does it cost to develop new products, how are prices set, how do companies arrive at, um, at the decision to set prices in various markets and greater transparency with regard to prices, it's going to be very difficult to break through this. Thank you, Ellen. Time is running by. I think we'll take one last question, if you agree, and then our experts will be answering. Uh, my name is Madhur Sach for essential medicines. And I appreciate we are talking about transparency in R&D, but I'm curious, when we talk about transparency, how much transparency is considered to be exactly transparent? Like, in other words, how much detail-oriented we are at the basic level of innovation at where like, data is being generated? And also, is there a way uh, where WHO or any governing body can verify the, any innovation by reproducing that data? So I'm just curious. If you, and you can, thank you. There are, there are various levels of transparency, various issues that need to, that would benefit from greater transparency. You refer to um, uh, the clinical trial data, for example. The ability to assess what is what we're getting actually better than what we have is incredibly important. You can only do that if you have full disclosure of the uh, of the science behind it. Greater transparency with regard to the cost. I, I, there we have it. it. It begins to emerge because in academia there's more work. Um, in, in this field, but of course the pharmaceutical industry could disclose that. You could make that part of the conversation. If you want a certain price, why don't you tell us how you arrive at that price? Um, if I take the case of Europe, for example, where we grant, um, or we are our, our, our patent offices rather, uh, grant patent extensions of, uh, mm -hmm. of up to five years, they're called supplementary uh, uh, protection certificates, a after the 20 year patent protection mm -hmm. has, has run out, based on the premise that that 20, 20, 20 years is not sufficient. Now, I would say, let's turn that around and let's say, disclose that that 20 year has not been sufficient. In that case, it would perhaps be fair to give a little bit more, because if you haven't been able to recoup your investment in that 20 years, then perhaps you should have some more. But it is given based on a, an assumption. It's almost a belief system rather than an evidence-based uh, based system. Now, I could go on and on because there are many other areas where greater transparency is necessary, but these are just some of the examples and um, I think would, would, would help clarify. There are very different levels of transparency yeah? from, uh, from the cost of innovation, where you have also to take into consideration the failure of the system. I mean, uh, it's not just the, the studies for one or the research for one medicine, but you have to know how it is structured. Uh, but uh, you have also to know what is really 
the cost of uh, innovation and what is perhaps uh, uh, only p uh, cost of marketing. Yeah? There is a suspicion that the cost of marketing is higher than the cost of innovation in the pharmaceutical industry. So, I mean, we have to know uh, how this cost, uh, and we have the level of the price. And it is uh, interesting to know that uh, for some differential prices, the contract is, or for some um, um, retrocession, comment est-ce qu'on dit, des, des réductions de prix? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Discount. discount, for some discount, you receive a discount, but you don't have to speak about the discount. Mm -hmm because the comparison between the different levels of, uh, of prices uh, are arguments that uh, might uh, bring some countries to be more, uh, to demand more uh, discount for themselves. So WHO has a role to play and they do, they try to make it more transparent from the system of the pricing uh, between different countries. I think this is very important. There is also the transparency of the patents themselves, because the patents are a very complex system. For one medicine, you can have 100 patents, perhaps. Uh, so bringing WIPO also to have a, a, a better transparency of the, of the system of patents to allow the people or the generic industry to know exactly when is the patent finished, what can I do at this moment, and so, is also very important. And we had also witnessed situation where the entry of generic was delayed because of this lack of transparency. So there are different levels, different actors, different stakeholders uh, that are uh, called for action uh, when we speak about transparency. Thank you. I think this... Uh Sorry, we've covered a lot of ground, probably more than we thought, <laughs> <laughs> but it was great. Thank you for your presence. Our experts are available now for interviews, and you can find all relevant uh, document reports campaigning on our website. Thank you.